what we will be looking at is a very unique and interesting chapter. It is one that is filled uh, with images and different yeah. beasts and mm -hmm. different types of uh, visions and the interpretation of them. Um, there's also a link to another chapter in Daniel that you will see and you'll notice and we'll bring that, I'll bring that to your, to your attention right now. Morning. So we'll be looking at Daniel, uh, the vision of beasts and its interpretation. And we'll be looking at that right now. So previously we have read a couple of chapters, one, two, three, four, five, six, just before chapter seven, we're encountered with Daniel who had in chapter five been thrown into a lion's den, right? Um, did the lions eat him? Nope. Nope. Not once. They ate somebody else, right? So here we have beasts dealing with Daniel and the likes. Furthermore, the next chapter in chapter six, we see this writing on the wall that happens to uh, King Belshaz uh, Belsh Belshazzar who is, um, oh, sorry, chapter five is the writing on the wall. Chapter six is the lion's den. And we're seeing something very interesting here about how Daniel seems to be a very in tune prophet. He seems to be able to interpret dreams. He is seeing uh, images and being able to see, de decipher them. So that's what happened. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, we're reading about Daniel who gets a dream, right? And I would like someone to read for us verses 1 and 2 of Daniel chapter 7. Who could read for us Daniel chapter 2? Ja Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. I have it. Go right ahead okay. and read for us. Earlier during the first year of King Balthazar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw a vision as he laid in his bed. He wrote down the dream and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm turning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. So verses one and two are putting us into perspective of what's going on here. Daniel is not walking around. He's not in the field. He's not working at his desk. He is actually um, in his bed. He is lying down. Uh, he could have been sleeping. He could have been in a remote. He could have been just waking up in the morning or going to bed at night. However, this is not the case because he is given a dream. He sees the dream and he writes it down immediately. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Have you guys ever dreamt a dream and you couldn't remember it the next day? Or you had a dream and you wrote it down? You ever written down your dreams before? No. No? I never remember them. You never remember them? Okay. Um, bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. Okay. Sometimes it's good um, to write down your dreams. Other times it's not so good, especially if they're uh, nightmares. You don't want to write those down. <laughs> um, but it's, it's good to know that, you know, when you write them down, it helps you to keep track of those things, uh, journal or, or the likes. But back in those days, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have smartphones that you can go and tell your story on TikTok or Instagram or Snapchat. You know, when they wanted to record something, they had to write it down. Um, this is around a time where paper was not easily accessed. So when you wrote something down, it was a serious thing that you wanted to record. So Daniel is about to get a vision and, and describe it to us in a very weird and interesting way about things that are about to take place. Now, who can read for us verses three? Read for us verse three, just verse three. Verse three. Mm -hmm. um, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different, different from the other. All right, stay right there. So in this dream, he is seeing beasts. 
Now, the word beast that's being used there is used to describe animals, but not necessarily animals that are from the animal kingdom. It's, it's a, way, a way of describing not monsters, but strange animals, animals that are not normal to their, to their, to, to their setting. Um, you're going to be seeing this in a couple of minutes, but there are these images of animals that will look different because when you think of them, they're not the same as before. So if you can read for us verses 4 until verse... Uh, um, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. Those verses, please. Chapter 7, verses 4, 5, 6, and verse 7. I can read. Go ahead. Right, starting from verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. Right, good. So we are, and uh, let me try this again. Uh, I can't see you guys. Um, so what we're seeing here is these images that are popping up that will give us an idea of what Daniel is seeing. He is seeing something strange. He's never seen them before. He is about to, he's about to see something that um, many of us have never seen. Um, just waiting for my computer to not act up. There you go. So in verse four, it says the first was like a lion. Now, how many of you have ever seen a lion? You've gone to Granby Zoo, you've seen a lion before, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it looks something like this, right? It looks like a lion that's right there. However, this lion was different and it had wings of an eagle. I watched, Daniel says, until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. Now, one of the scariest things you'll ever see is a lion run up to your car and jump on its two legs and lean on your car. You realize that a lion is actually taller than your car and could easily just crush you with its weight. Now, Daniel is seeing this and seeing this lion that has wings, its wings get torn off, and now it's standing up like a human being and has a heart like a man. Something that's very telling. Now, the next image that we see is that of a bear. Daniel describes a bear. Now, we live in Canada, and there are bears that live in our neighborhood. Not so much Montreal, but out west, up north, you can run into a bear if you're not careful. Um, not as deadly and as scary, but here we have an image of a bear that seems to be raised on one side. Now these are non-copyrighted images for those who are watching, so no, uh, no photograph for photographer's rights have been violated, <clears throat> Jason. Um, so we don't have to worry about paying anybody, but here is this animal, this beast, this bear that seems to be raised up on one side. Like if it's got a stronger shoulder or it's got a stronger side and you have to be careful of that whenever you see a bear walking towards you or looking at you intently, this bear 
had in its mouth three ribs and it was told to get up and eat and fill your and get up and eat your fill of flesh now that's a scary thing if you've ever seen a documentary of a bear eating a, a trout or hunting a deer or chasing down any other animal it gets its prey right and it eats a lot in order for it to survive after that the bible tells us that here we see a leopard, but it's something that looks like a leopard. It's not exactly a leopard because it seems to have four wings. It has four wings on it. Well, now, here's the thing with, with, with the Bible when it comes to wings. In the ancient world, wings were seen as not the ability to fly, but the ability to move quickly. It was a way of denoting that this is, some, this is an animal or beast or person that can move very, very quickly. If it had two wings, it can move fast. If it was four wings, it's even faster than that. If it had six wings, it was lightning speed. So those are some of the images that you'll see popping up. But this leopard had on his back four wings like those of birds. And the, this beast had four heads as well. So I couldn't find a four-headed leopard because it doesn't oh, exist. And I've got one. <laughs> So you have these images that are come up and I will show you something, what it looks like, what an artist drew of them later on. Now, after that, verse seven, in the vision at night and before me was the fourth beast, a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. In Daniel chapter seven, we're never told exactly what, who, what this beast is. It doesn't look like anything that Daniel has ever seen before. Um, I remember in one theology class, they were telling us that, that it's possible that it could have been an elephant because there's no word for elephant in biblical Hebrew. Um, they would not have known about dinosaurs because they've met, they didn't discover any of those bones yet, but it was a beast that was unknown to them. It was very unknown to them. It was scary. It had iron teeth. It had horns. It was awful. It's just like whenever you see a lizard or a spider or a tarantula, you don't want to hang around. You just see this thing and you start moving in a different direction. So this mystery beast is very powerful. It has large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whoever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. Okay. Now, there seems to be something similar with these images that are here because if you look at this image here you have this lion with wings a bear with ribs in its mouth one hump a leopard with four heads and four wings and then this beast at the back that's scary that's we don't even know what it is it, it, it's just crushing everything and it's got horns it's got iron teeth it's crazy now, is that something you want to see in your dreams? <laughs> now, I don't even know why Daniel described it as a dream, because to me, that, that's a nightmare. <laughs> that is something that's scary, you know? Like, if you show me a picture of a dog, if I see that in my dreams, that's a nightmare. I don't want no dogs in my dreams. Um, if you see animals that are popping up out of nowhere, that are just showing up on the scene, it is something serious. Now... The thing is, Daniel is getting this dream, but it seems to be paralleling something else that was, son, that was done before in another chapter of Daniel. How many of you guys remember Daniel chapter 2, I believe it is? Daniel chapter 3, sorry. 2. Let me correct that. 2. So that I don't look like I the, don't the, know what The image? Was. The image? What was that? You're talking about the image? Yes, the image. Like the statue. Two. No, no, two. It's three. Daniel chapter two. two. Yes, two. Two, sorry. So, um, in Daniel chapter two, we are, um, let me share the screen again. Share that screen again. And share. A lot of buttons just to share. So in Daniel chapter 2, 
please share. Thank you. We had another image that was that that popped up on the scene. But do you guys remember who it, who exactly got the dream of the image? It was Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar got a dream. But did he get a dream of animals? What kind of dream did he get? Uh, the dream of the, the statue. Statue. So a dream was given to, to, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. He dreamed of a statue, an image, right? And remember what the image was? It was an image of head of gold, chest, silver, a chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, and we had iron legs, and we had iron and clay feet and toes, right? This seems, according to us, according to the scriptures, it seems to be almost the same thing as these animals, what they're representing. So I want you to remember this image here. Remember these two slides. Remember these two things, that the image from Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 seem to be paralleling each other. Okay? Anybody want to take a last look? You're good? I hope I'm not giving anybody nightmares for tonight. Okay, drink some warm milk, almond milk, preferably. So to bring down the interpretation of this, we're going to break it down before we deal with another image at the end, which is this horn that comes out of nowhere. But I want to first establish one thing. The lion with the two wings that are plucked is symbolism for Babylon, right? So... In Daniel chapter 2, Babylon was symbolized by what? A head of gold. A head of gold. Because that truly represented Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. Because Babylon was a golden empire. It was truly like a lion as well. Because it was able to um, overpower other nations. It was quick to come to power. But it was very ferocious. Babylon was a very ferocious empire that conquered a lot of, a lot of countries uh, around it. It was not the gentlest of countries. But remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, something happened to him. I don't remember you guys. I wasn't there with you. But in Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 4, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Did something was, happen to him? Was, that was the chapter when, when I don't know if I should say he went crazy, but when he, yeah, he went crazy and then, you know, he was like in the wilderness, in the fields, kind of like mm -hmm. living like an animal almost for seven years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we see that this is truly a, a, a good representation of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, after he went crazy, he finally came to his senses. And this is a good way of, uh, that Daniel is seeing how the heart, how the lion stood up like a man, was given a heart. And that you can read that in Daniel chapter 7 and reading from verse, uh, and verse 4. The first was like a lion and it had, wing, had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being or a man. And the mind of a human being was given to it, the mind or heart. So this lets us know that here we see that, how can I put it? Nebuchadnezzar was kind of had his senses knocked in. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> in, a, in a very friendly way of saying it. Um, it's, um, how can I put it? It, it, it? It's 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 one way of describing how Nebuchadnezzar had this moment where he was no longer a beast. He became a man. And Babylon was no longer that beastly empire. It finally became an empire that finally had a heart. And, and also the ba Babylonian empire was the one that established synagogues for Jews. It was the one that allowed the... the how do you put this? The, the, the people of God to be able to 
to grow and also become more, you know, to live so that they can live. Now, the head of, li- the, the head of gold, the lion with two wings, Babylon, right? Babylon. I won't give you the exact dates because sometimes the dates can be a little bit, uh, how can I put it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It can, it can bog you down, you know? It can mm-hmm. bog you down. Um, but uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Let me see. Just pull that up. Next image. Next image we see is that of a leopard. The leopard parallels that of Daniel chapter 2 because in Daniel chapter 2, I'm oh, sorry, the bear. Sorry, not a leopard. The bear was one that was the chest of the chest and arms of silver. Mm-hmm. Okay. And based on human anatomy, you have two arms, right? Mm. You know, like Israel, you have two big, strong arms. You don't have weak arms like Jason. So some people are stronger on their right than their left. And others are stronger on their left or on their right, but you have a stronger arm. Three the Medo-Persian Empire was not equal in terms of the Medes were of the same strength as the Persians. It was actually the Persian Empire that was much stronger than the media the, than the, Med, the than the median per, uh, median empire because the Persian Empire needed to ally itself with the Medes in order to do their do their conquests and move on. Now. In, Dan- in Daniel 7, you see the bear that seems to have this flesh in its mouth. Yes. And that is truly one of the examples of how the Medo-Persian Empire was conquering and it was able to take the flesh. In other words, it was able to rip an empire out from its core. Okay? Because the only way that you get ribs is if you open up the meat. Right? Right? For those of you who are vegetarian, I know it's hard to describe this, but for those of us who eat, you know, lamb chops or beef ribs, getting at the ribs requires you to tear inside the carcass. Mm-hmm. The Babylonian Empire, remember how it fell? It fell because the, the Medo Persians were able to get inside the kingdom through the well, through the watering the water access, the aqueduct, and sneak up into the empire and take the kingdom. And we remember that from the, the, from the prophecy about Daniel and the, the writing on the wall, right? So that is one of the things that we see here uh, that's taking place in this, how do you put it? Um, in, 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 this part of the, in this part of the Bible. So we see here Daniel chapter 7. Where these four, where this one of this empire, the bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire, and it was an alliance that took place. Mm-hmm. Some people say that the three ribs symbolize the three main conquests of the Medo-Persian Empire, such as Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, for those of you who know about Egypt, Egypt is a very strong empire in the ancient world. Uh, Lydia was a strong empire as well, and Babylon as well but it was truly one of the representations of a bear, the Medo-Persian Empire. It later became just known as the Persian Empire, which is where modern Iran is right now, because the Persians took over everything after a while. Next image. In Daniel chapter seven, we read that after that I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. The leopard represents Greece. Well, the Greek empire, to be, uh, to be exact, that was established by a f- great and famous Greek king. Do you guys know the name of the, the most famous Greek king? Oh, was, was that Alexander? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Now, remember the, what, what was described of the leopard. The leopard had how many heads? Four. 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 And how many wings? Four. 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 
right? The four wings, as I said before, represent swiftness and quick and the speed. And it truly represented Alexander the Great's conquest of the then known world. He conquered the world by the time in his mid thirties, he had conquered most of the most of Asia Minor. He only got stopped in India, right? Now, for someone so young in his thirties to have conquered the world, some people have trouble buying a house in their thirties. Some people have trouble becoming CEO of a company in their thirties. Daniel was able to, uh, it's not, not Daniel, but Alexander the Great was able to rise to the kingdom to the top and conquer Lydia, Egypt, Babylon, he took over from the Medo-Persians, headed over to India. He was conquering quicker than you can even think. The Greeks were quick. They marched, they conquered, they moved on. They marched, they conquered, they moved on. It was truly uh, a good representation. However, Alexander the Great didn't live very long as well. We all remember he died young. He was a drunk. Some people say he died of a drunken stupor. Others believe that it was, you know, some heart attack or some poison. Um, but either way, Alexander the Great the boy done could not get past mortality and he died. His kingdom was divided amongst his four generals. These were the closest four generals that he had. And these four generals moved on with the empire and they ruled for quite some time. Now, you know what they say, all good things must come to an end. There is another image that shows up of another empire that in history books, when you read history of the Christian church or history of the world, the Roman empire was truly a, a force to be reckoned with. It was something that, you, that came out of a horror story. Imagine you're facing an army that no matter what you threw at them, rocks, spears, bows and arrows, all it did was just ricochet off of their shields. Imagine an army where they fought like Greeks they were strong like Babylon, and they were terrible. The Roman Empire had this policy of scorch and burn. I don't know if you guys ever heard that expression, um, you know, scorch and burn. Uh, that's when you just take everything, destroy everything, and burn everything around you. Um, I remember when I was younger, you know, some... Older women at church are telling me, be careful. Some girls, they might scorch and burn you. You know, <laughs> they'll take you for everything and then break your little heart and burn you to the ground. Um, there are many women that are told, you know, don't let no man scorch and burn your life. It's a way of des describing someone that comes in, conquers you, takes everything you have and leaves you with nothing. Okay. Now, the Roman Empire was like that. They came in, they conquered you, they, I, they either enslaved you, you were either second class, third class citizens, they taxed you galore, and if you dared rise up against them, they would crush you with an army that hardly ever lost. That was the Roman Empire. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel says that this beast was terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled them underfoot wherever they went. And uh, I tried to get this image here from a source. And it says here, the third kingdom was, was to be placed by the fourth. The metal of iron is symbolic of pagan Rome, the Rome of the Caesars. While not specifically mentioned in Daniel, it is the next world power after the Greeks, as noted in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Um, the image of gold or, or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations or their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. This is the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Chapter 38, volume four. The iron legs represent the Roman Empire. The mystery beast represents the Roman Empire. Now, any questions so far? Did I lose anyone? Am I going too fast? 
Is my English not as pronounced well good? We're good? Very good. All right, good. So, the last sentence in, in verse 7 says, It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Horns are a, how can I put it? A dreadful representation of power, of the might of an animal. If you see an animal that has horns, you have to be careful of those animals. Can you guys name me some animals that have horns? You guys know any animals that have horns? Bulls. Say again. Said bulls. Okay. Like a bull. A like bull, rhino? yeah. Like rhino. Bulls, yeah. Rhino. Rhino, yeah. Rams. Bulls. Rams. Rams, yeah. Mm. Any other animals you can think of? Well, antelope, they got horns, I don't know. You know, think, think Canada, think Canada. Come on, people, we're in Canada. Like, like, like horns or antlers or ah, like all in that. <laughs> there you go. So have any of you have seen caribou, you've seen uh, deer, there's rhinos, which Sister B said, there are rams, which many of you have said. Now, you have to understand, when you have horns on your head, um, these animals, they're actually kind of like, they're grown into their skull and fused into their backs so that they are meant for high impact. They are meant to fight with their heads, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember one teacher told me one time years ago in, in primary, Mitch, you've got to learn to fight with your head like a deer and start fighting with your hands, mm -hmm. you know? Because sometimes we don't want to use our heads, we want to use our fists. But these animals that we see that have horns in their head, these horns are symbols of kings, of royalty, of power. Um, the Roman Empire did not last. How can I put it? It did last very long. But it had many rulers. There were many Caesars that erupted. There were many kings that they had to depose. Many people that they had to get rid of. To move into their, to move into their glory, um, in chapter seven, verses seven and eight, Daniel sees this image of an of, of a beast that has these iron teeth. But it says in verse eight, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. Now imagine you're seeing this image of this animal that has these horns on its head, and you're thinking, what do these horns represent? Unbelievable. And all of a sudden, you just see this little horn start to grow. Just start to grow. But it looks very different, okay? Now, please forgive me. These images are non-copyrighted. I take them so I don't get charged and people don't, you know, call police on me. But it shows us how a horn can grow out of the skull and be impressive and also force out other, other horns that are on the head. With deer, anytime they start shedding, they, they scrape their, their antlers onto the side of birch or wood. I remember that from Pathfinders, but I saw it in person one time while walking through a park here in Quebec. Um, you'll see caribou doing that too, mooses as well. Moose. Uh, a moose will, will do that. You'll see uh, rhinos. Well, one of an endangered species, people, they're hunted for their horns. But though those things grow out of their heads and they grow in an impressive way. But this horn in Daniel chapter 7 was different because unlike the other horns, this one was growing and it was coming out. It uprooted three other horns. And this horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being. And it started to speak. Now, this is why I always have trouble with this Daniel chapter 7, because he says it's a dream, but this seems more like a nightmare. This seems like something out of a horror movie, because when you see a horn, you don't expect it to start speaking. 
It's like child's play. Chucky, a doll start talking to you. You don't talk back to it, you run. It's like the wall. If you see the back of me and you see handwriting on the wall, I'm not staying here, I'm leaving. Daniel sees this horn come up out of nowhere and it just doesn't look like a man. It looks, it has eyes like a human being and it starts saying boastful things, mm -hmm. boastful things. Now, the boastful words that it, was, that it was pronouncing are actually blasphemous words. Now, how many of you know what blasphemy is? What is blasphemy? Who knows what blasphemy is? Uh, to me, that's kind of like when you start going around claiming something to be true when it isn't. Mm -hmm. That's a definition, yeah. Um, what, what's another good way of doing that? Is it like something that's immoral, like? Immoral. Very good, Maya. Very good. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. Um, when you guys think of blasphemy, the word blasphemy is denoting something or, der or, or deriving something that is divine and attributing to yourself. Now, when you look at blasphemy, uh, Blasphemies, oh, blasphemy. Um, looking for this right now. Remember when Jesus was accused of being blasphemous? When he said he was the son of God. When he said he was a, the son of God, that's right. So blasphemy was something that was accused if the act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things. Um, it's also a way of using profanity. When you swear, in the old English, that's considered blasphemy. Um, there were times in the Bible where Jesus was accused of blasphemy, and you can find that in Mark chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. And could someone read that for us, please? Mark chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Mark 7? Uh, yeah, go ahead. 23? Yes. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And from thence he rose, arose, and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man known it, but he could not be hid. Oh, okay, is that Mark 7, verse 22 and 23? I'm not sure that 23. Okay. I got the number. 22. Sex, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lavishness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we see that blasphemy is actually a serious offense, right? It is something that if you commit it, it's labeled with murder, theft. It's labeled with arrogance and slander. It's something serious, right? Now, remember at Jesus' death, uh, sorry, at Jesus' trial, when Jesus was being asked, are you the son of God? I want someone to read from us Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. Matthew chapter 26. It's the last chapter. One of the last chapters, sorry. Matthew chapter 26. And we'll start with verse 57. Fifty-seven to what? Sorry, I mean fifty-nine. And we will go until 64. Sorry, 65. I have it. Go ahead. Now the chief priests and elders and all the councils sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. 
but found none yet, but found none, yea, thou, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none, at, at the last came two false witnesses, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answereth thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Um, until when? Until 65. Two more verses. Um, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming into the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, clothes saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold now, ye have heard his blasphemy. Okay. So this is, I wanted you to read these few verses in order for us to get a full picture of what blasphemy is in the biblical sense. Blasphemy in the biblical sense is not so much just using profanity. It is really taking what is attributed to God and claiming it for oneself. Blasphemy was actually one of the sins that if you committed blasphemy, they could stone you in, the, in ancient Jerusalem. If you described yourself as God or claimed to be God, if you acted as if you were God, it was blasphemous. It was pompous. It was arrogant of yourselves to claim those things, right? Now, when Jesus claimed to be the son of man, or when he walks in and says, you know what? I will coming in clouds. Was he being blasphemous or was he being truthful? Truthful, right? So... Jesus is being truthful. So it's like this. If I walk around and tell people, I'm a black man, I'm a black man, am I lying or telling the truth? I'm telling the truth. You know, the police know I'm a black man. I get in my car, they know I'm a black man. You know, in your case, it depends. You know, don't worry about these naysayers, okay? Now, if I walked around and told people I am a white man or a white woman and I'm looking like this, that's wrong. Okay? Now, when we see Jesus attributing to himself divine rights, he is doing so justly. In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn is claiming pompous or blasphemous things upon itself because it's claiming that it is divine, that it is sacred, that it is holy, that it is better than everything else. Now, you can't do that. Okay, now who knows which commandment blasphemy comes from? Which of the Ten Commandments is the one that really, you know, blasphemy comes from? Kind of a combination. It's a trick question. Which commandments or commandment? Like the one that's like bear false witness. Bear false witness, yes. Okay. It's the second and third. Thou shalt not make for thyself any golden images. And also you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay? So taking an image and ascribing it as God, that was blasphemous. Misusing the name of God or claiming to be God, that was blasphemy. That was a sin that was punishable by death. No excuses, no pardon whatsoever. And also, God always looked down upon blasphemous, uh, blasphemous proclamations from any entity, whether it be man or beast, that is popping up. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, we're seeing this little horn that rises up. Somebody cooking in the background? What's that noise, Mr. Somebody cooking. Um, hold on a second. There we go. Oh, okay. It wasn't me, but it was somebody else. Um, so Daniel chapter 7, we see this image of a beast, of, of a horn that has eyes like a human being and has a mouth that speaks pompous words or blasphemous words or words against the most high. 
Now that's a strange thing that could happen, all right? But the, after you see the rising of this horn, there's something else that appears, right? And before we get to the interpretation, I want someone to read for me verses 9 to verse 10 of Daniel chapter 7. 9 and 10 of Daniel chapter 7. Who can read that for us? Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, 9 and 10. Yep. What till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. All right. So as soon as he sees this, as soon as Daniel is there contemplating and thinking about the horns, this little horn rises up, uproots three other horns. It rises up and starts to have a mouth like a mouth like a man. It speaks both words, eyes like a human being. But then he looked and he saw thrones that were set in place. Now these thrones were more like court seats, or in our in our modern world, right? And his clothing and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, as he was reading for us. Now it seems to be the court is set and the books are open and judgment is taking place. Now let me read for you verse 11. Then I continued to watch because of the bolsa words the horn was speaking to the, the horns was, were speaking the horns were, were speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, it's important that we get the full image and the full picture of everything that's going on in Daniel chapter 7, because if we stay stuck on the horn, we never realize that the vision doesn't end there. It ends on the fact that the beast gets destroyed. The other animals are stripped of their authority, but the Son of Man has given authority, dominion, and power, and reigns forever and ever. Now, you're probably asking yourself, okay, Mitchum, we get it. What does all this mean? Let's look at this interpretation. In verse 15, can someone read for us verses 15 to 20? Fifteen to twenty of Daniel chapter seven. Well, you guys should have it open there. It says, "I Daniel was grieved in my spirit within. I Daniel was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him." <laughs> the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, 
and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before which there before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. All right. So here is Daniel getting into, thank you for reading that for us. Um, Daniel is deeply troubled by the, uh, deeply troubled inside himself about the vision that passed before him. And he wants to get an explanation to that. Now, unbeknownst to us, any time a vision or a dream, and in the Hebrew, visions and dreams are kind of interchanged. In today's world, you get a dream. It could you be just dreaming about, you know, swimming in money or driving a fast car or sitting on the beach somewhere in Antigua. But when you look in visions in the biblical sense, it is something that is being directed at you. You are being shown something by someone. And usually in Daniel's visions, an angel or an attendant, a messenger, is there showing them something that's going on. So Daniel wants to know what the meaning of all these is. So he's still in the vision. He's still in the vision. And he wants to know exactly what's going on here. And the, 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 the angel tells him, those four great beasts are four kings. Nebuchadnezzar, you had um, King Belchus. King Belshazzar, you have the, the Darius, sorry, Darius, Medes with Cyrus. Then you had Alexander the Great. And then you have Caesar, Julius Caesar. Or sorry, it's Augustus Caesar, the first one. Um, I could have mixed those up. So these are the four kings. But verse 18 says, the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Now let me go back a second here and show you guys something about the image, about parallels between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 2, in the image, what happened at the end of the, the, the story of Daniel chapter 2? Did the image, the statue, stay up forever? No. No. What destroyed and grinded to piece the entire statue. Meteor or something? <laughs> no, it was a stone that was cut out without hands that came that, and yeah. struck, that struck the, the toes or the, the feet and grinded everything to pieces. And what happened to that, that stone? It grew into a mountain, right? And it lasted for how long? Forever, forever, forever. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees these images of these beasts, but do these beasts rule forever? No. But verse 18 is actually good news for each of us because it says, but the holy people, that is God's people, will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. That means the people of God, whether they're conquered by the, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, it could be the Americans. It doesn't matter. God's people will have a kingdom that will last for how long? Forever. 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 Most of us here reign from the Caribbean. Few of us from the continent of Africa, one of the countries. Most of us here have only had our independence in our countries for as long or as, as 60 years, 70 years at most. Only one Caribbean island has had independence for 200 years, and that's Haiti. But our kingdoms have not lasted long. And we know it takes one hurricane to wipe out everything on an island. Hurricane Gilbert did that to Jamaica, almost did it to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You had... Uh, different hurricanes striking different parts of the country of the world, uh, typhoons, tsunamis. We know how fragile our kingdoms are. But God is saying that the people of God, we're going to get a kingdom that will last forever, that can never be destroyed. Babylon will come and go. 
Medo-Persia will come and go. Greece will come and go. Rome will come and go. But God's kingdom will be forever. So my plea to you guys, just a little plea, a little pastoral plea, be part of the kingdom of God because it's the only kingdom that will last forever. Amen. Okay? So Amen. we're moving on here. Um, verse 19, then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different. As our reader just told us, this beast was terrifying. I also wanted to know about the ten horns and the likes of that. In verse 21, it says, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when, the posse when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High, oppress his holy people, and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So that is a lot to drink up before we even move any further. Um, the fourth kingdom. Daniel was troubled by the fourth kingdom. It's like when you see an accident on the road. There are some people who see an accident. You see a car hit another car. You're like, oh my gosh, call the police, call the first responders, go see if they need help. There are other people who are watching it and they'll say, oh my gosh, there was an accident and that kid in the back kept playing on their iPad. They can't get over the fact that the car spun around and the kid stayed on their iPad. Never miss a beat. Daniel is like that with the image that he's seeing. That fourth beast at the back, he wants to know what's that about? What are those horns about? What's going on in the back? I, I, don't, I don't care about the lion, the bear. I've seen a bear before. The leopard, you know, just run away from it. But that beast at the back is a scary beast. What is it about? The attendant, the angel, tells him that this fourth beast is a fourth kingdom, which will be Rome. And later on, we'll realize that pagan Rome becomes papal Rome. Let me say that again. Pagan Rome, which was run by Caesars, later on becomes run by religious leaders who were papal, okay? such as popes and the likes. Now, this empire will speak pompous words against the Most High. It will persecute the saints of the Most High, and it will intend to change times and laws. Now, I wasn't able to put together all the slides on this because that's about another 25 slides. Um, but to speak about the pompous words, the Roman Empire was truly a pompous empire because they allowed something that was called emperor worship. The emperors of, Ro of Rome kind of copied what, the, what the, the, the pharaohs of Egypt were. And the pharaohs of Egypt were king, were king gods. They were kings who believed that they were gods. And when they died, they went to go join their other gods. That's why they built those huge pyramids. That was their tombs. Um, the Roman Empire had empire, emperors who proclaimed that you had to worship them in order to become a citizen or to keep your citizenship. Um, Nero did it. Domitian did it. Um, uh, King Augustus, King Julius Caesar. These all were men who spoke pompous words. They declared themselves as God. They were very sacrilegious. They would destroy temples and wouldn't care if your gods were alive or not. They sacked Jerusalem. Um, with everything they could. They persecuted the saints of the Most High. Um, in the Bible, you'll read in the book of Acts, for those who did Bible, um, the first persecutors of the Christians were Jews. The second persecutors of the Christians was the Roman Empire. 
So let me say that again. The first persecutors of the Christians were ancient Jews. That was Paul and the Sanhedrin Council. They persecuted the people of God. But afterwards, it became the Roman Empire that started to, per that, that started to persecute Christians. And you can read that where Christians were thrown into Colosseums, tortured by all different types of animals. They were hunted, set on fire. Mm -hmm. um, one history book says that they, in the book called Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, Christians were lit on fire and they were actually like the lampposts that led people to the Colosseums. Mm -hmm. They were torches, human torches, as it, as it would be put. But weren't the but, Romans Christians? Mm -hmm. The where? When the Romans converted. That was later. <laughs> that was later. Okay, this is after this. Okay, okay, okay. This is later. But for a while, the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians for that. You can read about that inside the Book of Acts. Um, um, uh, well, Book of Acts, when the Jews started persecuting them. But the Roman Empire had no love for the followers of Christ. Um, you can read about in history books, Emperor Nero. He was a very crazy emperor. He set Christians on fire, throw them into the Colosseum as entertainment. Yeah. They were torn alive. They were torn apart by wild beasts. Uh, parents with children, children with parents, parents by themselves, children by themselves. You believed in Christ. You were followed with Christ. You were fair game. Um, but later because, on... Because they were, they were killing them because they were taking away the glory and the praise from them. From, from the, yeah, they were doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. They were taking away all their rights. And one of the reasons for that, the reasons why Nero and other emperors were persecuting Christians because the Christians did not take part in their pagan worships. Yeah. Okay. Christians believed, and for those of us who are Christian online, I hope all of us, um, we believe in one God. We don't worship other gods. We don't worship gods made of statue or stone. So if anyone tells you to bow down to a statue or stone, our response will be, no, sorry. You know, um, Diehard Christians, and I hope we're all diehard Christians, even on pains of death or imprisonment, will not worship any other idols or statues or any person as God. We believe That's in right. one God. We believe in one God, and we will bow to only one God. Bad um, man the battle. You know, uh, just like the Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter in <laughs> Daniel, we will not bow down to any image of gold. We will not bow down to any one. We do not bow. All right. All right. So, <laughs> so another thing that Christians did not do is they did not take part in any sacrifices and likes like that. And the emperor didn't like that because everybody's doing it. You guys should be doing it too. The Christians didn't do that. They prayed to a God that no one saw. So it makes, so they only prayed to one God. It was illegal to be a monotheist. Polygam uh, uh, polytheism was a, was a better thing to do. You had to pray to a statue. Christians prayed to an invisible God. Um, and even they accused Christians of marrying or, or, or having incest because they would marry their brother or sister. Um, they would accuse them of cannibalism because Christians would take part in the body and blood of Jesus. And we know these are not true because the body and blood of Jesus is symbolic. It's taking part in the bread and the wine. We don't, we don't have incest in the church. We don't marry our actual brother and sister. We call each other brother and sister because we're all part of one family. But these are some of the reasons that the Christians were persecuted um, and, they were, and they were taken with them. It was a serious thing for them to be... <coughs> Don't turn on Siri. Thank you. Um, it was a serious thing and a crime against them that they would be persecuted. It also says that this power would think to change times and laws. Now, you know the old saying, if you can't beat them, join them. The Roman Empire persecuted Christians so badly, but the Christians never seem to dwindle. They seem to be multiplying. <coughs> Every time a Christian died, it seems as if four would rise up. Every time someone would be persecuted, more people would join. 
Um, it is said that the blood of Christians watered the ground for evangelism. People saw these people, these people dying for a belief, for a cause, for a person named Jesus, and they wanted to know why. And when they discovered who Jesus was, they realized it's the best reason to die for. Christians started multiplying. And there came this emperor by the name of Constantine, who married a Christian, and then in order to appease the other senators in the empire, took his army and himself and marched through some bed of water. And he said, look, we're all baptized now. We're all Christian. The empire is Christian. <laughs> and as funny as that sounds, that's basically how it went. Constantine made one of the biggest influences on Christianity by making an entire empire, an entire uh, kingdom become Christian. And many things changed because Christians usually worshiped on Sabbath, and now they brought in worshiping on Sunday. Um, it was a day of veneration to the sun. This is why for thousands of years, Christians have been going to church on Sunday. That was done through Constantine at first. Later on, the Roman Catholic Church established that the official day of worship was Sunday. They wrote this inside their catechisms in the Vatican uh, Chronicles. Mm -hmm. They proclaimed it. They said it themselves. The Roman Empire changed times. They changed how celebrations took place. They changed laws to suit themselves into Christianity. And that is something that the Roman Empire did through Constantine and the likes. But it moves on because later on, this is where we come to um, the consequences for the saints. The angel gives the time frame for the activities of the little horn. The little horn that you see rise up. Let me go to it, my rhino. So I was trying to find one horn and everything kept asking me. It was either an image that was ugly or an image that cost me money. And I'm not bawling like, like Jason. So this little horn was, you know, this little horn that rises up. It wasn't just speaking blasphemy. It was also doing activities. You know, it was its activities were done to persecute the people of God to be blasphemous and to change times and laws. But the Bible tells us that it wasn't going on for all the time. The Bible says to us in verse 25, time, times, and half a time, right? Now, this would be in the prophetic interpretation, a year, two years, and half a year. And half. Now, I don't want to start an Instagram meme or some Instagram uh some video viral video but one plus two and a half is equal to one is equal to one two sorry one plus two plus a half is equal to what oh I thought you said equal to one <laughs> <laughs> So I'm still waiting for an answer. <laughs> so, Three, and a half. <laughs> Three and a half. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. All right. You'd be surprised how some people will move that and say, no, the one year goes into the two and the two and a half, you have to divide it. And brothers and sisters, it's simple math. One plus two and a half is three and a half. That's it. Okay. Now times is a way of describing years. So that's a year, that's three and a half years. Now, three and a half years in prophetic interpretation um, based on the day year principle, which the Seventh Adventist Church prescribes. In the Jewish calendar, there are 360 days in a year, right? So that's 360 times three plus 180, okay? That's 360 times 3 plus 180. It ain't deep math. It's simple math. 360 times 3 
plus 180. 180. What does that give you? Let me try it again, All right? It will give you 1,260, right? That's it. That's, 300, that's 360 times three plus half of 360 is how much? 180. 180. That's right. So that gives us 1,260, which is 1,260 1, years. Now I know we're going to have to come back and look at this in a different prophecy when we get to Daniel chapter 8. But it's important that we note that the duration, this, the dura during this time, the little horn will mount an attack against God's people for 1,260 days, which are years. And this we can get um, in Seventh-day Adventist theology. We believe that from 538 BC, uh, AD to 1798, this is the period that the little horn had its activity. Okay? So that's 538 to 1798 is the little horn phase. That is when the persecution was heavy, when the oppression and the, the changing of the laws and times took place, when the blasphemy took place within papal Rome, that is papal Rome, when the papacy was running the old Roman Empire. In, um, in history books, they say that the, the Roman Empire did not fall, it declined, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference between falling and declining? Anybody know the difference? No. Um, I guess you can say, a fall, I guess, compared to like the fall of Babylon, the fall of Medo Persia, that's like someone coming in and actually causing your demise. That's right. It's a decline where it's like generally, gradually over time, or like by nature, or just within itself, it just falls apart. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the Roman Empire didn't get conquered by anybody else, there was no other empire that could come in. And just to make sure that you guys understand the vastness of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was, um, how do you put it? There's an expression that says the sun never set on the Roman Empire. Just like the British Empire, the sun never sets. Did you guys know that? If you look at the British Empire, it's old British Empire. Britain actually controls Canada. Well, used to control Canada to Australia. So no matter where the sun rose, Britain always had a kingdom that was had a sun shining on it. The Roman Empire was somewhat like that as well because they stretch from as far as Europe to as far as India. Mm -hmm. And it almost seems like based on how the sun rises and sets, there's always the sun that's, that's, that's over the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Now, no one was able to conquer the Roman Empire, but it did decline, right? It declined because uh, moral corruption, financial corruption, um, decay of, uh, of society took place. Uh, Germanic tribes came invading from the north and took over certain portions of the Roman Empire. Um, and some people would say that it was ruled by 10 kings or 10, 10 rulers for a while. And we will look into this. Um, to how this, um, this kingdom somehow lost its favor and this little horn rose up and somehow just took over everything else. Um, the papacy is, and for those of you who don't know the papacy, the papacy is basically the- Papal Rome. The popes, the administration of the, of, of the popes. Um, it's just like the presidency. It's not about one person. It's about the institution. You understand? The papacy is the institution. It's not just about one pope. It's about many popes and the institutions that were there. Um, in Christian history, you learn that there are some popes that didn't care what they did. They got the job. They basically got dressed up, walked around, 
bless people. There are other popes, they realized they had power and they wielded power, okay? It's just like when you were discovered that you're the head chef. There are some people when they become head chef, they continue with the old menu. Other people become head chef. They head start to roll. You're fired, you're fired. We're gonna have chicken instead of beef. We're not having any soup. End of story. Some popes were like that. They, they were martial law and even some of them went so far as to declare that they were the representatives of God on earth. Let me say that again. There were a few popes that declared that they were the representative of God on earth. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's only one person who was a representative of God on earth, and his name is Jesus. No one else can claim that. You can say that you are trying to be and follow the will of God, but you can't say that you're, you're walking in God's place. You know, Our parents can tell us that they can put the fear of God in us, but they are not God. Mm -hmm. For those of us who were raised by black parents, we know what we're talking about here. Amen. Okay. <laughs> right. But there is no one that can replace God. There is no one that can usurp God. And that is what the little horn was trying to do. Papal Rome was trying to become boisterous and pompous and blasphemous by declaring its own dominion as if it was ruling anything in its, state, in its place. Now, it's, it's, it's important that we understand a few things here about Papal Rome. Papal Rome was not a... It didn't have everything sewn together. Let me put, that, let me put this in other words. As much as they tried to unite the kingdom, they weren't able to do so. Because... There came a time in history where the papacy did get, did get struck. It got hit with, and I won't go into General Berthier and the, the, the imprisonment of the, of, the, um, of, the pa of the Pope. At one time, there were three Popes running around. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one Pope in France, another one in Rome, another one in, 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 in another part. And they were each saying, I'm the Pope, I'm the Pope. And people were like, who's the Pope? Mm -hmm. And then one Pope was put in prison. And everybody's like, how did the French come around and just take over like that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, c'est la vie. That's, that's the French. <laughs> when they want to do stuff, they do stuff. But it, was very, it is very important that you note that with all the kingdoms that come about, with all the empires that rise, every last one of them falls. And even the little horn that rises up, does it last forever? No. It does not last forever. There comes another kingdom that will last forever, and that is the kingdom of God. Okay? Daniel chapter 7 does not end on the note of the horn. It ends on the note with the kingdom that will last forever, and it is the kingdom of the Most High. Mm -hmm. God's holy people will get the kingdom handed over to them. This is why whenever you do this Daniel prophecies, whenever you get into Daniel 7, people like to spend hours talking about the papacy. They talk about, oh, the Pope was so bad, the Pope was this, the Pope was that. The story is not about the Pope. The story is about how God's people will rule at the end. Amen. Okay? The purpose of the story is to tell us that God's people, as much as they're being persecuted, they will be vindicated. They will get a kingdom. They will no longer be pushed around. Okay? No longer are you going to have a landlord. Now you're going to be a property owner, and the deed has been paid. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is where it is important that we understand that to be part of the kingdom of God is the greatest kingdom that we can be part of because it's the only kingdom in all of Daniel's prophecy that lasts how long? Forever. Forever. You become a citizen of Babylon, it won't last long. You become a citizen of Persia, won't last long. Greece, won't last long. Roman Empire, won't last long. Papal Rome, won't last long. 
Only one kingdom lasts forever, and that is the kingdom of God. So Daniel chapter 7, as much as he was disturbed by the matters that he, was saw, that, he, that he saw, and his face did turn pale, he kept the matter to himself. Because there were still other things to understand. Sometimes God sends us troubling messages, not to scare us, but to reassure us. That even though there may be beasts that show up, they will not last forever. God will give his kingdom to his people. God will rule, the sovereign ruler, with power and greatness in all things that are there. Now, I like to end Daniel's study with a reading of Jude. Jude 24 and 25. It's a benediction. But I want us to read it and I want you to hear something here. To him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God and our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and dominion or authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. At the end of Daniel chapter 7, there was a court scene that showed up, right? When you go to court, and I hope that none of you ever get to go to court, you better hope that you have a good lawyer. You better hope that you have a good judge. You better hope that you have money to pay any of these people. Because if you don't, it's over for you. If your case is not solid. You're going to have to pay or you're going to jail. Now, in Daniel, we realize that the courts were set, but the kingdom was still given to God's people. Even though they were being persecuted, even though they were being trampled, even though they were being terrified, they still came out victorious. And the only person who can prepare us to stand before the courts of heaven is Jesus Christ. And he did that for us by shedding his blood. This is why Jude tells us to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault. Only God, only Jesus can present us before his throne spotless. Only Jesus can cleanse us so that we're pure before his father. Amen. Only Jesus can prepare us for the end. You could become a master guide. You can get all the honors. You can become a Boy Scout. You can become Prime Minister. None of that will get you through the courts of heaven. It's only when you claim the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, to him who was able to keep us from falling, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory and honor. Now, are there any questions on Daniel chapter 7? I know we went a little bit over time, five minutes, but I can take a few questions. Daniel chapter 7. Any questions, concerns, worries, comments, observations? Um, yes, actually. All right. So looking at the, um, the fourth beast and seeing how it was kind of set apart from all the other ones um, and that being a representation of the Roman Empire, um, do you think an argument can be made that this, um, the Roman Empire was deemed so important because it just so happened that, you know, at the time that the Son of Man came down to earth um, and was crucified, that it was under the reign of the Roman Empire? Do you think that has anything to do with it? There could be. There, there have been some people have said that the reason why Daniel says he couldn't describe the beast um, was because the, the way Rome was or the type or how it behaved, it was very crushing. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, an old movie. Uh, they had an opening scene of war, which they tried to stay faithful to historical records that the Roman Empire, they would burn everything, even the trees around you, you know, 
<laughs> when they finished the war, it looked like a, looked like a swamp, you know? Um, but it was also the empire in which Jesus was born um, and grew up in. And it was significant because of a couple of things. Uh, Galatians tells us that at the right time, God sent forth his son. And the Roman Empire was truly a great time to have proclaimed the gospel because the Roman Empire had roads. They built roads that you stayed on a Roman road, you can go as far as you wanted. You didn't have to travel through the woods or the mud. Um, they had a common language. Um, they used Koine Greek, a very common language that everyone could speak. So if you wrote something in Greek, everybody would understand it, you know? Um, they had a um, financial system. They established a financial system. Of no longer were you trading a cow for a sheep. Now you were trading coins. You were using coins. They borrowed that from the Greeks as well. There was also... Yeah? Hello? I said, was it Bitcoins? <laughs> like Bitcoins, yeah. <laughs> Bitcoins, yeah. Um, <laughs> The Roman coins are actually very well preserved in terms of the material that they were using. But it was truly an, an empire of iron because I don't know if you ever held a piece of iron. It's very hard to break it. Like you can run over, you, you can, your car can run over it. It won't break. Gold can be broken. Um, bronze can be broken. Um, brass can be broken. But to break a piece of iron, you need to get hydraulics to like me just to bend it it's very difficult to break iron um in chemistry class i remember i don't know if your chemistry teacher was as crazy as mine but she was showing us the breaking point of certain metals or the melting point of certain metals and some metals were harder to melt because it needed more temperature and iron was a very hard thing to melt <laughs> don't let that thing get on your skin so the the roman empire truly was described as uh, uh, one of iron. It was crushing, devastating. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was the empire that killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. Killed Jesus. Two spears in his side. Two iron tips pierced his side. Uh, yeah. Hope that answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Concerns, worries, you get everything, understood everything. Was I clear to everybody? Was, no, was man, you, you, you did a good job. You did a good job. Yeah, you. thank you PowerPoint too. Yeah, you made, you made everything so crystal clear, man. Good job. Thank, thank you very much. How about, how about our younger audience, guys? Did you understand the thing or you wanted to go over something? Understood. I understood. Hmm? I understood everything. Okay. It was all good. Okay. That's We're good. going to ask you questions tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, um, if there's no other questions, um, you might want to read up on chapter eight. Um, I don't know when we might, we might do that next week. Right, Sister B? Yep. Um, chapter eight. Yeah. Um, Big chapter. So yeah. um, read ahead if you want. Don't be afraid to read the whole book of Daniel. Go through it. Go back. Read a few chapters before. Read it ahead. Um, it's good to know the story ahead of time. That way you might ask questions or have concerns and see stuff that you've never seen before. But Daniel is a good book, you know, especially Daniel chapter 9, his prayer and, you know, and the likes. Yes. Okay. So, if there's no further questions, Sister B, we're good. We can close here. We're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, can I get a volunteer to pray for us to close? Who would like to pray? I know it's intimidating, but. Well, yeah, we just name somebody. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
I'll do it. Sure. Go ahead. Erin Fire, thank you for bringing us all here today. Thank you for letting us learn something new or something more. Uh, I hope that we will all have a blessed Sabbath and we will see each other next week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to eat. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Thanks, Mitch. It was very good. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Uh, Do you know it disappeared easily? Um, yeah, it 